What's going on, y'all, ladies, gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode, your favorite weekly film. Better than, I don't know what, what else you guys watch these days. You got looping on Netflix and shit like that, but better than whatever weekly film you're planning on watch. You got Noah, myself. We're going to talk about the NFL. Later on, we're going to talk about the NBA, and we're going to talk about Top Shots. We got you covered for all the content needs that you have in this offseason. Obviously, Super Bowl happened. Tom Grady's a GOAT. He's going to be the GOAT probably for a long, long time. Won his seventh Super Bowl. Uh, I called that on my on my show. I'm joking. I didn't, I didn't call it. I just said I wished him luck, and I'm kind of glad that I saw it. I got to see it play out. Patrick Mahomes got eaten up, man. Tampa Bay Buccaneers defensive lineman ate him up like fat kids on cake. So that was interesting to watch. And a lot of Patrick Mahomes slander on the timeline. I thought he did pretty good. But, you know, at the end of the day, it is what it is. But that marks the end, the official end of the football season, the football NFL 2020 2021 season is officially in the books and it's over and you know what that means man it's the official kickoff of the dynasty offseason noah how you doing i was okay when the video started and then you said tom brady would be the goat for a long time as if justin herbert wasn't anointed the goat this past (laughs) season so that put me off a little bit also we got a few haircuts going on and Mike, yeah, once yeah. the video started, he questioned what was going on with my hair. I've been questioning it myself as well. Mike's looking pretty on the other side of the screen. It's just new. It's a new season, new us, whatever those Instagram quotes that your ex-girlfriend from seventh grade has been posting the past 17 years when she goes on vacation with her friends, new year, new us, new content. And today we're talking about who we're selling, which veteran players who've been in the league for three years or more that we're selling heading into this year. And I'm just going to tell you right now, you guys aren't going to be happy with some of the names that we have. They're not on like big teams, but they're probably on your fantasy team, which in turn makes you want to come at us in the comments. Come at us. We like a little healthy discussion. We like to talk through things. We like to take a deep breath and analyze the situation. So if you have any questions as to what you would sell them for, hopefully we answer those in the video. But if you have a scenario that you want to drop in the comments, hit us up and we'll get, we'll get back to you and we'll give you um, our advice on things such as that. But until we get into that. I think we have to do something that's more important than probably the content of this video. Let's get it going. I mean, no one wants to, everyone wants to be positive. You know, everyone wants to be in the up and up. Everyone wants to go to the moon. Everyone wants to ride rocket ships. Everyone wants to get on the next game stop before it tanks. Uh, but you know what, man? Someone's got to be the bearer of bad news, and that's us. We got to keep it real with you guys 100% of the time. Even if we stink, you know, even if our takes stink, we're still keeping it real. And that's that's what some of this is, man. We don't want to be Debbie Downers, but at the end of the day, you kind of have to start looking at some of this stuff because, you know, these guys, you know, guys in the NFL aren't getting any younger, man. And, and selling old guys is a flavor of the month. But at the same time, we're not going to come here and tell you to sell like shitty stuff that you can't sell anything for, right? So that's the key, I think. The one thing before we get into any of the any of the sells for veterans is a lot of times I go on Twitter and I see people like, oh man, like, oh, kill and blage, like sell high, like. Oh, um, Nicole Hardman sell high. Like, I think oh. the issue there is you have to actually own Kill and Blash for you yeah. to be able to sell him high. Yeah, like, oh, oh, you know, now people are like, oh, Nicole Hardman got got to sell him high. Like, who are you selling these people high to? Like, who are these people that are in your leagues that are buying them? Like, the, a lot of the times, selling high on a player means you got to sell high on a good player because not everyone's out there trying to buy shitty players, man. Like, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys have a lot of like shitty players that you guys play with, but for the most part. I mean, if you play in some savvy dynasty leagues, like people aren't out there trying to buy really shitty players. I mean, you have the you have the suckers, okay? There's a sucker in every league trying to buy low on Van Jefferson. That guy exists. Shout out Pretty Richie buying Sammy Watkins for that Patrick Mahomes stack. <laughs> that didn't really do too much, but we love you, Richie. Yeah. Yeah. Every every league has someone that's a sucker that's trying to buy one of these shitty players, right? That that have really low odds of success. But that's not the norm. So you gotta have guys that are actually, you know, favorable to some that, that we're willing to sell high. And other guys that are that a lot of the guys that I say to sell high on. It's not because I think they, they're bad or they stink. It's just that, hey, I think that their their value is capped. And I and whenever I see a capped value asset, I'm always looking for opportunities to trade down and get more assets. Those are the those are the types of trades that that I look to for the most part. Um, so I'm not I'm not really in the business of, of telling people to sell shitty players because I mean anybody can do that. Just literally just literally go on Twitter and you'll get plenty of advice like that. That that's not what we're in the business of doing here at Bunkbed Breakdowns. We're trying to provide like actionable advice. Oh, sorry. Let me 
turn my lights on so there's no wow you're here. just really showing me up today i'm recording <laughs> the dark right now um <laughs> Crazy yeah so glasses too <laughs> yeah so it's, it's not just about selling selling low and like selling shitty players it's really about finding when to get out on on really good assets as well so before we just just want to have that little preamble before we dive into things and just you know set the right frame of mind so that when when we drop some of these names you guys are like wow you guys fucking hate that guy you're he's a stud how can you be so stupid it's not really that mind of frame of thinking it's more just like hey let's let's explore what we can get out there for some of these guys um to, you know to make it to make it interesting right Yep. So countering Mike's point of not talking about shitty players, we're going to start with a shitty player, at least in my opinion. And by shitty, I don't mean like shitty, shitty, because he is in the NFL and obviously he's better than I am, but I kind of question that. We have Jared Goff, the new quarterback of the Detroit Lions. Now you would think that his ADP is a little bit suppressed because of that move. The ADP I'm using is from January, so I assume it's going to fall back a little bit. But even in January, he was being taken as the quarterback 15 off the board. And for me, at least, he is around that quarterback 20 range. And the reason for that, especially with this quarterback move is, sure, he's been good in the past, right? Looking at his fantasy finishes as of late, he's been the quarterback 17, 14, 7, and 9 on a point-per-game basis among quarterbacks who have played at least 10 games in those seasons. So if you look retrospectively, sure, he's being fairly valued in that sense. But when you look at the situation that he is now put in and the disparity between that situation and what he used to be in, First off, he goes from Sean McVay to fucking Anthony Lynn and Dan Campbell. So that off the bat should just tell you to fade him. But along with that, he goes from a situation that had, at one point, Todd, Todd Gurley in his prime, had Brandon Cooks, had Sammy Watkins, had Cooper Cup, had Robert Woods, had Tyler Higby. He had a lot of really good players. He had Cam Akers this past year. Then he goes to the Detroit Lions, who have a very talented rookie in DeAndre Swift and a really good tight end in TJ Hawkinson. But in my opinion, those two pieces aren't going to really put you over the top in terms of a fantasy quarterback. And we, we've seen Drew Locke fail despite having talent. We've seen Eli Manning fail despite having talent. Just because you have talent doesn't mean you're going to be good. And the fact that he doesn't really have overwhelming talent leads me to believe that it's going to be a struggle. Along with him having like small hands and playing in cold weather and playing really bad in cold weather, NFC North football probably isn't for him. Along with that, Marvin Jones and Kenny Galladay are free agents this year. So even if they bring back one or two of them, they franchise tag Kenny Galladay, what are the chances that they're there for the long term? So the longevity there, a lot of people make the argument that quarterbacks have a super, super long shelf life. And a guy like Jared Goff, who's what, like 26, 27 years old? Oh, he could be a starting quarterback for 10 years. He's so young. Would you rather have the known commodity and Tom Brady these next one to two years of elite top 12 quarterback play? or bet on a Jared Goff, who, in my opinion, probably has the same shelf life as a Tom Brady. And in those years when they're on the field together, when they're both playing concurrently, Tom Brady is going to blow him out of the water in terms of fantasy production. That was the argument I made for fading a guy like Drew Locke or Teddy Bridgewater this past year. Sure, they're young, but they're not really good. And when it comes to dynasty, it's not always about getting the youngest asset. It's getting the one that may have the prime in those few years that they're in the league, rather than trying to chase upside through longevity and through lasting longer than another player because they're simply younger instead of actually being good at football so when we compare him to guys in his range right Matthew Stafford quarterback 16 I'm sure they will flip-flop with this change so we'll kind of throw that out the window but I'd rather have Kirk Cousins than him who is quarterback 18 off the board consistently undervalued he's consistently like a top 12 to top 15 quarterback option you can get him later sure he's a few years older but his contract is ridiculous and he didn't just get traded and three round picks for a 33 year old so i'm sure the vikings have a lot more faith in him than whatever the hell the lions think that jared Goff is and as i said before tom brady just off the super bowl this isn't even recency bias right quarterback 20 off the board just get the two years left that tom brady probably has of elite play surrounded by elite weapons. And now it's coming out that Mike Evans wants to take a pay cut to help bring back more weapons in this offense. I, there's no reason to get a guy like Jared Goff who has these one to two years when those one to two years probably aren't going to be good. And then the last point as well is he has a crazy contract, but he has a zero dead cap hit after 2022. So he's probably just going to be a bridge quarterback anyways. And with how high of draft picks the Detroit Lions are looking to have these next few years. I think they're number seven overall this year. Maybe they take a Jamar Chase and give him a weapon. But if you can't do anything with Jamar Chase, then he is probably going to be gone sooner rather than later. So just because he's younger doesn't mean you have to invest. And I think he's just a very mediocre quarterback who doesn't have the rushing upside to help build that floor week after week and year after year. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. This is, this is, I think, in my opinion, the only really shit player on our list. And I don't even know what we can sell him for. But like, I think 
this is a case where I'm kind of happy to just solo and see what happens. Right. You know, you can get, maybe you can get like a first, right. A late first, someone that's QB needy. They think he's still young and maybe they resign Kenny Galladay or whatever. But I think it's, I think it's asinine that, that he gets ranked ahead of Kirk cousins. I, I think that, I would think that was ridiculous even before this year. I'd like our cousins better than jerk off. Um, I think Kirk cousin, like you said, is consistently, consistently underrated. And what, because he's what, four or five years older, who cares, man? He's like low thirties. Like that's, that's still a decent amount of time for quarterbacks. So I agree with you. I mean, I would, I would dump Jared Goff for, you know, all those guys you said, but more importantly, I would dump him for like a couple sec round picks and super flex, maybe even an early second, you know, early second looking at a Deami Brown, looking at a, you know, some of these other guys, um, or even from- Mac Jones or Jared Goff. That's tough because I don't know where Mac Jones is going to go in the draft. If, I mean, if, I, if he gets, let's say this, if Mac Jones gets draft capital, I'd rather have Mac Jones with draft capital. So that's how it feels. That, well, if he goes top 20 or if he goes to like New England or whatever, I would rather have Mac Jones because at least he's going to have the ability to show his worth. Whereas Jared yeah. Goff, if he fucks up once, he's probably not going to play much again in the future. Whereas Mac Jones might get one or two chances because he is a rookie and because he does have that Alabama pedigree. Yeah. The one thing I will say about Jared Goff, though, I don't know if you saw the report, but basically the Carolina Panthers offered their eighth overall pick. They offered Teddy Bridgewater, I think, for uh, for Matthew Stafford, which, in my opinion, is a lot better than, you know, the two 2022 and 2023 picks that they got from the Rams plus Jared Goff. So it could mean that, hey, they actually do like Jared Goff a little bit, at least a little bit. So it might give him a little bit more rope than we think. And then also it could mean that like I one report I saw said that it was because they were pandering to Matthew Stafford and Stafford didn't want to go play in Carolina. So, which also, you know, makes a little bit of sense. I'd be surprised if that was the main reason though, because at the end of the day, these guys are trying to run a business. So, um, but yeah, just, just something to keep in mind, but I totally agree with you. That's a, definitely a sell. Um, I think, you know, let's jump to one of my cells here real quick. I think, I think actually our cells back to back are, are kind of similar. Um, so, so I'm going to go with mine first, but it's, it's David Montgomery and, uh, David Montgomery, I think it's interesting, right? Cause people, people are going to really think about how he took him to the championship. He had an incredible run, incredible run. He was like a top, what is it? Top three, maybe like top, was he the running back one even for like that final was, other than, I think he was running Mara back had one. That six touchdown games. So yeah. Yeah. I think, I think other than come, come on, but then Kamara had like a bunch of shitty games in between too, with Taysom Hill. So I think like David Montgomery was, he was either like one or like at least top three guaranteed for like the back half of the season carried a lot of teams to championships. Right. And that's great. So I, I but I think whenever I see players like that, that do like kind of have that like championship attachment, it's like, it's good to explore because people do have emotional attachments like that, you know, but for me, I, I'm ready to, I'm ready to punt David Montgomery off my teams at any time, because at the end of the day, like they did have like a really, really easy schedule going down the stretch. And also Tariq Cohen was gone. So we don't know what's going to happen with Cohen, but if Cohen comes back, you can expect him to eat a lot into that receiving share, which is part of the big reason why he was doing really well. And then also Trubisky's not back and David Montgomery with Nick Foles is not good, right? Because I, I mentioned this before in the season, but he really benefited from Trubisky. Trubisky sucks as a passer. We all know that, right? But he does provide something on the ground, which Nick Foles did not. And a pocket passer does not help him. So, I mean, it, does Carson Wentz help him a little bit? Maybe. I, I mean, I don't know. But at the end of the day, like, this is not a good offense I want to bet on. And I, I'm not even so sure that the Bears don't like add someone to the draft. Like, I, I don't know that. And so there's just a lot of question marks there. So, and I think I've, I've been seeing him go for like running back one value. I mean, I have him ranked as my running back 20 DLF actually has him running back 20 as well. So from an ADP perspective, maybe it feels like I'm trying to sell at value, but I think realistically in terms of trade value, we can get like, if you can get like a mid first for him, I think that's super protected value. I'd rather have that. If you can get a mid a first plus a late first plus a second, I think that's good value. I think even pivot from him into one of our buy, buy, uh, buy low wide receivers, like Cortland Sutton, right? David Montgomery for Cortland Sutton. Plus I, I bet money you will get that deal done, right? Cortland Sutton plus second round pick for David Montgomery. Would you smash that? It really depends on team need. I'm not as big of a proponent as selling Montgomery as you are just because the price at running back 20 after him, there aren't really many guys that I have any faith in that can be even like a running back two on my roster, maybe a Damian Harris. But after that, it's kind of, it's slim pickings and maybe you can re-roll the dice on an ETN or a Javante Williams in the mid first. Um, but then again, David Montgomery is not too old. And I feel like the NFC North might be Chicago's for the taking because Aaron Rodgers is getting older. He was a little bit unhappy. You know, Jared Goff is now on a rebuilding team. The Minnesota Vikings don't have a defense. I don't think he's um, a, a huge sell candidate just looking at his price. But I mean, if you can get a Sutton in a mid round for or a mid first or a Sutton in a second, you're having embarrassment of riches at the running back position, then maybe that's something I'd explore. But for me, it's just, it's tough to sell a guy like Montgomery who, you know, he def- definitely did struggle as a rookie, but he didn't put up a terrible season 
um, when it's all said and done. And this past year, I think he proved that he can kind of be less of a guy who shows his hand when he's on the field. Whereas Tariq Cohen, when he's out there, you know, they're passing. David Montgomery is kind of agnostic in the sense that you don't know what the offense is going to do when he's on the field. So I'm a little bit bigger of a fan than Montgomery of Montgomery than you are, but that's not to say I'm not going to not sell him for anything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, it's not, it's not that he's a bad player. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I think his value, at least from a trade perspective, maybe not from an ADP perspective, but from a trade perspective, I feel like it's a good time to cash out. But again, just goes, goes to show, uh, you can have different opinions depending on what your team, what your team needs are. Um, most of the time in my, on my teams, if I have David Montgomery, he was not really my running back one running back two. Cause I wasn't really high on him. The only reason I have him is because I bought him low on a couple of squads. So he's probably like my running back three, four. So at those types of positions, I'm basically willing to cash out, especially if I'm a rebuilder, I'm cashing out on him um, just to see what happens and, and store it in value elsewhere. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm, I'm willing to trade for rookie picks at, or a wide receiver plus a rookie pick. So I think those are some decent deals that can be explored. Yeah, and I'm in a similar boat with a guy like Josh Jacobs, the same running back class. And as you said, like Carson Wentz might go to the the Chicago Bears and just fuck up Dave Montgomery. I'm waiting for him to go to the Las Vegas Raiders and just complete his tour of ruining every 2018 running back, whether it's Miles Sanders, Dave Montgomery, or Josh Jacobs. But look at what Jacobs has done throughout his career. He's a very good running back on the ground but that doesn't really do much for you in fantasy, right? Being really good between the twenties and having touchdown variants is not something I want to bank on, especially when he's being drafted as the 10th running back off the board. When you can have guys just looking at the price of other players, this is the only argument I need to make cam Akers, Antonio Gibson, Aaron Jones are the RB 14, 15 and 16 off the board straight up. I'd rather have all of them. Now you may say, Oh, Aaron Jones, you'd rather have him than Josh Jacobs. To me, it's the same argument as the Jared Goff, Tom Brady thing. I'll take the next two or three years of Aaron Jones being a top five, top six, top seven running back over Josh Jacobs being maybe the RB 12 or 13 on the season, which is what he's kind of been. But how many times this past season did you feel comfortable slotting Josh Jacobs into your starting lineup? The only times he ever gave you any sort of value was when he scored touchdowns. He's extremely touchdown dependent. And I know he was uh, among the league leaders in touchdowns this year. He scored a whole bunch. But when you have to rely on a guy falling into the end zone and picking up six points because he's not getting chunk yardage, he's not used in the passing game consistently, and he's just all around not a great fantasy aspect, asset from that point of view, along with him continuously being banged up, missing a few games his rookie year. This year, I believe he only missed one, but if you think back to the season, how many times was he on the injury report? How many times was he a game time decision? How many times did people want to pick up Devontae Booker because they thought he was going to break out and take his job? He's just too much of a headache for me to want to take him as the 10th running back off the board. And if somehow somebody will give you a Cam Akers or an Antonio Gibson for him straight up, I would do it. And honestly, looking at the running backs coming into this class, I think once you get into that Javante Williams and Travis Etienne that second tier for me, it's really a coin flip because I think both of those guys, Travis Etienne may not be a great pass catcher, but I think his breakaway ability will give you a little bit of something that Josh Jacobs lacks. And I think Javante Williams being a true three down threat and having the potential to land in a spot that wants to use him in that sort of way could also trump Josh Jacobs being that one to two, uh, that first and second down runner that really relies on goal line carries to be fantasy relevant. So that's where I'm at with Josh Jacobs. He's obviously an incredible talent, and he runs behind a really good offensive line that was banged up a lot this year. But I don't want to invest that heavy of draft capital into a pretty one-dimensional asset. Uh, I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think with, with Josh Jacobs, like, I don't it's a it's a tricky one for me because you know if you look at what he's done through the couple of years, he's you know, he's been a pretty pretty damn good asset. Now, granted, he's a bit more boom bust, but you know, that's kind of goes to the territory of anyone that's not a like elite, elite top end workhorse. It's like a top five guy. Uh at, at the running back 10 price, though, it does seem a little bit too costly for me. Um, so I think at that price, I, it makes sense to kind of explore some sales. I do think you know, this is why I'm like, so like tricked out by like using ADP as a marker for a buy sell. Cause I think that's, that's just not really, I don't think that's like where like people really value him, you know, like I, I think like if you if you go out right now, like if, if he's going what RB 10, that means he's like a mid second round pick that would usually command like two, two middling first. I think if you go and try and get two middling first draw shakes right now, you get shot down like nine times out of 10. So that's why I think the ADP is like probably a little bit out of touch with what's, what's actually happening in reality. So, you know, from that sense, I don't know how, how, how big of a sell he, he really is. And, you know, I think people have cooled on him similar to 
to how you have cooled on him because we haven't seen that target volume. But if you look at what he's done the past few years, he's been an RB1 back-to-back years as a 21-year-old, 2020-year-old, 22-year-old. Puts him in pretty good company. I mean, but I guess the other way of looking at that is like, well, Leonard Fournette was also like a top and running back for the first two years, right? And then, you know, for the first two years, similarly, Leonard Fournette didn't get much passing volume. So it wasn't until his third year that he actually kind of got that step up. So maybe Josh Jacobs gets a step up there. I, I wouldn't really bet on it too comfortably because they've been saying that for a couple of years. We just haven't seen it happen. Um, but like, I agree with you that I would probably rather have him than a, I would probably rather have like a Cam Akers uh, over him. Um, but I don't think that's by like, it's by enough for me to like, really like, you know, put my, put all my chips into it. I think I would definitely rather have Gibson over him. Aaron Jones again is like a little bit of a toss up for me there. So yeah, I think, you know, it just really depends on what you can get in your leagues. I think a better trade would be like, especially for trading running backs like this, right? if you're in like a rebuild mode or something like that, it would be to take like the David Montgomery and the Josh Jacobs of the world and flip for a wide receiver plus a rookie first. Like those are, I think, think the moves that are really going to cash you on money instead of trying to go running back for running back. It's it's, those are like harder trades to make because a lot of people like view them as more lateral, but that's kind of where I'm at with, uh, with Josh Jacobs. I do think is he's worth exploring as a sell candidate. You know, he maybe people are still kind of living off that rookie year hype and they're still looking at those big games and still looking at the fact that he finished as an RB 10 overall, even though on a points per game basis, he was like RB 15, 16 or something like that, which is actually where I have him ranked. I don't know where you have him in yours, but I have him in, in that range, like the middling RB two. Yeah. I've been running back 16. My only concern for him too is, you know, there is potential for the receiving game to be there because although he was in the timeshare at Alabama, that was kind of what he excelled at in terms of comparing him to other running backs that he shared the backfield with. Uh-huh. But then again, he reminds me a lot of Joe Mixon where the argument was, yep. okay, it's next year, it's next year, it's next year. And next year never came. And the fact that Josh Jacobs now has a good offensive line and then maybe Derek Carr isn't there for the long haul, what if they go through a quarterback change? What if they draft a quarterback who isn't good? And then now he's behind an aging offensive line with a bad quarterback and then you can't sell him. So for me, he's just somebody I'm trying to get off on or get off on. I got to cut Ew, that shit out. <laughs> get get out damn, on. Damn, you hate to see it. You hate <laughs> to see it. He's somebody I'm trying to get out on before it's too late. And I think if he is being valued anywhere near the 10th running back off the board, I think that's the prime time to sell a guy like that. Because I mean, the same arguments for, Joe Mixon was that he's a great running back, a great running talent who has receiving upside, but neither of those things really materialize into fantasy production yep. now three, four years down the line. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. Uh, okay, so next up on the list, um, we got DJ Chark. So, I mean, this is your boy. I mean, I actually had him as like a buy, someone I was willing to buy high on. I've, 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 I've cooled a little bit on him because I think, you know, now that like Trevor Lawrence is going there, the hype is getting a little bit too crazy. Um, like, whereas I already had him there, um, now he's like gotten that bump. So similar to like, if I'm investing in the stock market, right. I have a target price for what I think a stock should be worth. You know, once it hits that, I'm like kind of fine getting out. And it's like, to me, it's like kind of shot beyond that now because of what people are doing. People are, are, are pumping it up even more because of Trevor Lawrence. Right. I think at our price of wide receiver 25 is just way too, way too rich for me, given that there's just way too many guys in that tier, right? So if I can trade from a wide receiver 25 down to like a wide receiver 30 and get a, get a pick, I think those are the right arbitrage opportunities you'd be looking at. Like I'm doing my wide receiver ranks right now and it is deep. It is really, really, really deep. I mean, I'm looking, I'm looking like 30, maybe, maybe even like 40, like 35 wide receivers deep and I'm comfortable, right? You, you, I'm looking at guys like Adam Thielen, you know, Jerry Judy, like as much people hate on him, Will Fuller, Brandon Cooks, Robbie Anderson. Like if I can flip into a lot of these guys and get a second round pick get a first round pick, I think those are, those are definitely the money moves to make. And if anything, like I think LaVisca is going to be uh, more so the one to own there with admire there. Yeah. I think the issue too, is we're acting as if DJ Chark already is the alpha already has chemistry with Trevor Lawrence and urban Meyer wants to use him as the number one in this offense where when you look at this past year, and I know he was banged up a lot, but was he even the number one this past year? He did out-target a guy like LaVisca Chenault, but he only had five more receptions because those receptions that LaVisca Chenault is getting are a lot closer to the line of scrimmage. They're more imaginative. They're not just deep throws that uh, have a 50-50% chance of being completed. And LaVisca Chenault was very good after the catch this past year. We look at what Urban Meyer did in college with guys like Curtis Samuel, with guys like Percy Harvin with, I think he had like Paris Campbell as well. He tends to favor these more gadgety type of wide receivers. 
But even beyond that, right, we remember back to college with LaVisca Chanel. It's not like at Colorado he was just a gadget receiver. He was winning deep and also, like, to the point of being a gadget receiver who's lining up in the backfield. I think a player like that who is that that, that dynamic who showed out in his rookie year who also dealt with injuries and came into the year a little bit banged up, I'm not so sure we can confidently say that DJ Chark is the clear-cut one in this offense, which at the price of wide receiver 25, whereas Chanel is hovering around wide receiver 40, that's kind of what's being suggested. And even if we look back to his best year, right, his second year in the league where he blew up and came out of nowhere, we'll write off his rookie season because whatever, it's Jacksonville, and they probably didn't know how to develop him. They cut, like, fucking Alan Lazard, who was pretty good in Green Bay. We look at his second year. He is the definition of a boom-bust receiver, and he does win you weeks, right? So that's not always the worst thing. But wide receiver 25 off the board, when you can get a guy like Will Fuller, who showed he could be a true alpha but can also produce in a number two role this past season, uh, a Cortland Sutton, who we touched on, I think, last week about how like much we like a guy like that, who is shown to be a true alpha in the face of target competition, or even a Debo Samuel. Like I will much rather trust a guy in a Kyle Shanahan offense that has produced with George Kittle on the field than a guy in an Urban Meyer offense coming to the NFL and hoping that DJ Chark is the number one. When in reality, look back to his best season, right? The guys who's competing with were Chris Conley and D.D. Westbrook and Leonard Fournette out of the backfield. Now he has LaVisca Chenault there, and the Jacksonville Jaguars have a whole lot of draft capital and a whole lot of cap space in a very deep, not only free agent class, but a a wide receiver draft class. I wouldn't be surprised if they add another top-tier talent to the wide receiver pool in Jacksonville. And if that happens, right, you're not going to be able to capitalize on this price as the wide receiver 25 off the board. So if you can go out and trade him, and get a Will Fuller, who is currently the wide receiver 33 off the board, who is a little bit older and a little bit more injury prone, I guess you could say. I'd probably rather take Will Fuller straight up because I think he has a potential to be a true alpha and he can produce in a number two role. Uh, Debo Samuel, if you can get him in like a second round pick just because people are hyped up that DJ Chark gets to play with, LaVis with Lawrence, uh, Trevor Lawrence right now, I would do that as well. Even straight up, I'd rather Cortland Sutton than him. And I know I did a video about Brandon Cooks yesterday. If you can get Brandon Cooks and a high second for a guy like DJ Chark just playing on the age arbitrage, I'd smash that every day of the week. Just because he's three or four years older doesn't mean he, can, he can't give you the same window of production. And then adding an early second where you can realistically get a Rondell Moore or maybe even a Jalen Waddle or even like a Mac Jones if you're quarterback needy, that's a deal that I would take basically any day of the week. Yep, totally agreed. Uh, no arguments for me here. I think next up, all right, this is one that's probably going to – trigger some people uh so just want to let you know that i apologize for absolutely nothing so if it triggers you i don't give a shit but here we go Devonte adams okay i i love love Devonte adams he helped me won the flay the public he's one of my favorite wide receivers in the league i think he's he's freaking elite right he's got the best he's got the best release out of the entire nfl uh, the way he puts people on skates is incredible and he's tied to aaron Rodgers, who's obviously still playing at a very high level right but as i said in the beginning Sells are not always about selling shitty assets and, and selling out on wide receivers at the peak is core to my dynasty strategy. I'm always doing it every year. Last year, it was DeAndre Hopkins before the season. I, I sold all my shares of DeAndre Hopkins and I used him to acquire young studs and then rookie picks and additional assets that I felt like were on the rise. And I feel like this is another year where I can do that with the Devonte Adams coming off a wide receiver one overall season, probably won a bunch of people, their championships, um, you know, probably carry them in the playoffs, had an incredible, incredible season in a year where I think passing and, and passing touchdowns, passing yardage quarterbacks overall are very inflated, just given how COVID played out. We've seen it play out in short season before with the, with the NFL strike. So all those factors together, I think that, you know, we can get out on a Devonte Adams and you'll lose a bit on the points per game because Devonte Adams is elite. I don't think he's going to fall off next year or the year after that. But his value will. I mean, I think this is the peak where he's at right now, being valued as wide receiver two overall in ADP and valued as wide receiver one overall in a lot of your leagues, I bet, especially if your league values, you know, production and veterans and, you know, they have that emotional attachment. You're going to get wide receiver one type overall prices for him. And I think at that point is when you can really get a nice profit. Like, give you an example. Last year when I traded out DeAndre Hopkins, what I traded him for is I traded DeAndre Hopkins, Keenan Allen, for DK Metcalf, Calvin Ridley, and like Miles Sanders, something like that, right? Back when, before the hype, before Miles Sanders was the first round starter pick, before DK Metcalf blew up in the season. This is way before when they were all like third round, fourth round ADPs, right? And DeAndre Hopkins was still viewed as a top three wide receiver. Um, 
I think you can get those similar type of assets and similar types of value. So I think, you know, you could probably get Devonta Adam and trade him for like a CD lamb plus, right. And people love CD lamb. So maybe that's a little harder, but you could probably get T Higgins plus a first. I think that's an easy, easy deal to take. I think you can probably get T Higgins plus a first plus more. And I think those are the types of deals where I'm always looking to trade down in the draft, but after the draft is over, I'm also always looking to trade down at the wide receiver position and get more assets and more, more potential value increases for assets that have been capped out. So that's why I'm selling down to down to Devontae Adams. Now, if I'm a top end contender, do I sell them? It really depends, right? If, if my team is so stacked, I, I might consider just keeping him and riding him out. But even as a contending team, you can make that trade and still continue to contend, right? Cause I, I really think guys like T Higgins and Cortland Sutton, they're going to take that next leap uh, into the stratosphere and then their value is going to shoot up and you're not going to lose that much on the production, but like wide receiver isn't a place where you really need to get that much uh, production edge. Anyways, it's, you want to get that in other places, but like you could probably get Devonta Adams, sell him, And for like Michael Thomas, plus we talked about Michael Thomas as a buy low. Right. And will Adams outscore Michael Thomas next year? Probably. Right. But will Michael Thomas do as bad as he did last year as he did uh, as he'll do this year? Like, I, I don't think so. Right. And I think you can probably squeeze out a first round pick even if you're a contender. So I think, I think these are the types of avenues that I'd be exploring just when, whenever assets really peak like that, I think is a, is a good time to explore. And I know that's probably not going to, you know, fly with a lot of people and people might, might think I'm crazy. Uh, but I do think like these are the times where, you know, you can take advantage. Yeah. And if you just, I know you mentioned a bunch of guys who you can sell for, you know, a player plus a first, I think honestly, anybody from wide receiver six to 14, 15 in consensus rankings, you can easily get that player plus a first. So I think like a late first in Calvin Ridley, I would take that as well because a late first isn't a late first. A late first is Rashad Bateman, who has the potential to be a Justin Jefferson, has also the potential to be a Henry Ruggs, but also has the potential to be a T Higgins. So there are these upside plays. Like imagine before this year, Mike, you talked about selling DeAndre Hopkins, right? Imagine you sold DeAndre Hopkins for, we won't even use DK Metcalf because that's kind of an outlier. Let's just say some other some other middling wide receiver plus a late first round pick. That late first round pick turns into Justin Jefferson. Who would you rather have straight up now, DeAndre mm-hmm. Hopkins or Justin Jefferson? And sure, not all your picks are going to hit, but those L- extra bullets to fire and those extra darts to throw only increase your odds of adding like elite depth to your roster. Plus, you also get a proven asset if you're going to make that deal. Trade Devontae Adams for an Amari Cooper plus a late first. Trade him for a Chris Godwin plus a late first. Any of these guys who have seemed to have fallen off the map a little bit Absolutely. because of down seasons, like a Dak Prescott didn't play, which kind of hurt Amari Cooper, or a Chris Godwin was banged up all year and everybody thinks Tom Brady's going to retire even though he just won his seventh Super Bowl. Use, use that to your advantage and try to trade down at the wide receiver position. But again, as Mike said, if you do have Devontae Adams, if you just won your league and you have guys like a Tyler Boyd or a Keenan Allen or a Robert Woods, as your wide receiver six, seven, you do have that depth. Then at that point, maybe just ride out Devonta Adams because you don't need as much depth. And the point per game advantage is legitimately like seven, eight, nine points over most of those guys, because he is a touchdown threat, a touchdown monster. And he produces in the face of terrible quarterback play as well. Like Deshaun Kaiser was throwing the ball or like Brett Hundley. I forgot which one it was. He's still elite. So he is for me, a top five dynasty wide receiver. But if you can trade down and get another piece to help build up upon your depth, because this is an extremely deep class, I wouldn't be opposed to it. And it's crazy to say, right, because he had what, like 17, 18 touchdowns this year, playing 13, 14 games. But if you can get out on these top end assets who are aging, we make the joke about them being 35, but they are aging in situations with an aging quarterback. And you can move down to a Chris Godwin or a Calvin Ridley who are a bit younger. And the disparity there might only be four or five, six points a week and you can add another piece on top to give you depth, then that's a move I would like be very willing to make. Yeah. The other thing there is like, you know, we talk about, we joke about the the age curve, but it's very real, right? Like if you're dealing with the dynasty market, like after 28, 29, like the value just tanks. So you could, you could realistically sell Devon to Adams this year, right? Right now, get out on him and get in on a, you know, a CD lamb and Chris Godwin and still land that first round pick and end up with like Godwin plus Rondell Moore, right? And then a year or two from now, a year or two from now, Devonta Adams will still be a really damn good player. And you'll be able to buy him back for a fraction of that cost. So those are the types of moves that 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 you really need to think about making is timing the market and the dynasty yeah, Mike, market. Let me ask you this. Would you buy Julio Jones if you're a contender? Would you buy him Absolutely. for the 112 right now? Oh, as of for the 112 and a super flex, who's going there? 
Jalen Waddle. Damn, I fucking love Jalen Waddle. Uh, I, I, I would if, if I really wanted to make that push, but I don't think you have to. I think you could pay a second yeah, round pick. That's what I'm Julio. saying. Because on the flip side, if somebody were to offer you the 112 for Julio Jones and you aren't necessarily complete, competing, they're going to jump all over that. So just yeah. like you said, you might miss out on one to two years of Devonta Adams. But yeah. in that scenario, just threw out there, like Julio Jones next year, I'm not so sure isn't a top five, six wide receiver. And you can buy him for a late first because he is aging. It's crazy to like sell and then buy in the future. But like Mike said, in the stock market, I'm not well versed in this. So this could be like completely wrong, but get out early and then get back in when people think it's too late and then reap the benefits of a lower price tag at that age. Yeah. And the other part of it you mentioned is like, this is why understanding tiers is so important in your ranks. Like rankings by itself is so stupid, right? I don't, that's not how I draft at all. I look at my tiers, look at positional tiers and I go down my chart and that's how I approach a draft, right? Understanding tiers is key because like you said, if you're willing, like you have Dante Adams as a top three wide receiver, I have Matt wide receiver five, right? Um, but what's important is like within that same tier, I have Stefan Diggs, CD lamb, Tyree Kill, Michael Thomas, or there's like five other guys. So at any point, if I can get anything on top of those guys for a Devontae Adams, I'm going to take it every single time. Because if, 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 if we don't know much, but what I do know is this, everyone, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Matthew Barry. I don't care if you're Ray Garvin. I don't care if you're Mike Up. I don't care if you're FB God. I don't care if you're the Godfather Nick himself. We all suck at projecting, everybody. I don't give a shit. Like whoever, whoever it is, we all suck at it. I don't care if it's the most accurate fantasy pros uh projector of all time i don't give a fuck we all suck okay so we're trying to like predict those inter inter finishes is damn near impossible so what you really gotta do is try to just predict ranges and for players that fall within a certain range you should always be willing to take the profit on the off chance that you're wrong because more often than not you are wrong right so it's better to have that profit to fire that dice again and even the trade down tiers when you trade down a tier that's when you can land the, the future first round rookie picks, right? Like I'm, I'm betting money that nobody has Chris Godwin and Devonte Adams in the same tier. Nobody has like Allen Robinson, Mike Evans, Calvin Ridley in the same tier as Devonte Adams, which means you could probably get a first round pick on top of all those guys for a Devonte Adams. And that those are the types of deals that really sustain dynasties, right? And, and build dynasties like trading down at the wide receiver position. Like I said, is the core of my dynasty strategy and the core of how I approach all of my teams. And it's, it's the easiest way to profit because people want sure things in wide receivers. And when they see wide receivers produce well, they think it's going to last forever because of longevity or whatever it is. And that's like the easiest market to, to, to profit from. And in, in my experience, that's where I've always gone. It's a cash cow and I've done it every single year, every single league. And more often than not, it's paid off. And sometimes it's burned me, but honestly, more often than not, it's paid off. Like, look at Stefan Diggs. Who the fuck thought Stefan Diggs would be a top three? I was receiver? just about to say that, Mike. That scenario I brought up before when I couldn't think of a receiver. Imagine trading DeAndre Hopkins for Diggs in the late first, which is a very realistic return last year when everybody thought Stefan Diggs would suck because they thought Josh Allen sucked. Now you get a wide receiver who's better and probably another wide receiver they picked at the 110 through 112 that's better than DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah. Yeah, and you have that opportunity this year. You have Allen Robinson as a free agent. You have Chris Godwin as a free agent. These are the guys that you can go for and take advantage of that of that discount. So, look, I, I don't want to tell people, but I do want to tell people because I love telling people. Uh, Devonta Adams, to me, to me is a great sell because, because he's at the absolute peak. There, there is nowhere else for him to go. I agree as well. And I know this last one is also going to get on some people's nerves <laughs> seeing as how he just dominated in the Super Bowl as well. But we got... Travis Kelsey, man of the hour, probably the best tight end in the league. Mike is going to tell you why we're selling Travis Kelsey, though. Yeah, so it's a very similar thing. I think, you know, again, if you're a very true, like, top-end contender, you're probably not selling Kelsey, right? But that's not that's not most people. Most people aren't, like, completely fucking dominating their league. Like, I'm dominating a couple of leagues. I'm not selling Travis Kelsey. But if you're anything short of, like, that top, 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 elite, elite, like, elite tier of contenders – you should absolutely be selling Travis Kelsey. Even if you think you have like a like just a good shot of making the playoffs, I think you got you gotta sell him. Cause again, what he did this year was was incredible, right? And, and I think he'll do it. Like he'll do it again, like next year, maybe again the year after that. We don't know when the clip's gonna come. I think tight ends last actually a lot longer than wide receivers. So he probably has another two, three, four years, maybe even. But if you're not a top end contender, like people are living off the highs of Travis Kelsey winning them a championship. Right. And 
there's guys, other guys out there like Darren Waller, who I, who I'm a big fan of. I think Darren Waller is incredible. He's like a few years younger than Travis Kelsey. And there's no reason for me to think that he can't come close to that production. He won't be exactly at that. Right. But he could come close. Um, if they ever do get a QB upgrade or if Derek Carr ever like takes off the blindfold and throwing deep, we'll never know. Um, but I think Travis Kelsey, you know, DLF has him at, at tight end two. I also have met tight end two behind George Kittle. Um, but I think, you know, selling to a contender because people have really felt the pain this last season of tight ends. I mean, we feel it every year, but we felt it a lot this year, right? Because we lost George Kittle. So all we had was Darren Waller and Travis Kelsey. But I think you go out there and trade a Travis Kelsey for Darren Waller plus, maybe Darren Waller plus a first, maybe Darren Waller plus a second, right? And I think those are those are like really good deals to make because again, it kind of just extends your, your value. And yeah, you definitely lose a bit on the points per game because the advantage Travis Kelsey gives is massive. It's arguably better than anything else, any other position other than maybe like Christian McCaffrey. But you get to you get to extend the life of your team and you don't lose that much, right? Like the guys I'd be targeting with the Travis Kelsey trade would be like Waller, Hawkinson, or Fant plus like plus a first, right? Plus a second. I think those are the types of deals you'll be looking for. So I'm not saying to sell low on Travis Kelsey. And again, if you're a topic contender, you're probably just going to ride him in the sunset. And that that's totally fine. But for most of us, like these are the types of assets you got to explore selling because we don't know how long he's going to last. I, I mean, I think he'll last a couple more years, but you know, once he gets a couple more years tagged on, you're not going to get anywhere near the price you can get for him now. And now you can kind of capitalize and get, you know, get a really, really, really good return. And, you know, I think guys like Hawkinson and Fant like can be the next ones to take that step up. Maybe not like Travis Kelsey tier, but take that next step up to becoming a, a consistent, uh, you know, weekly producer for your team. Yeah. The thing is also, if I'm selling Travis Kelsey, I'm not going to sell him unless I also get a tight end who has at least established his own value in return. If you're mm-hmm. going to trade Travis Kelsey for like Hayden Hurst in a first, that's not a return I want because you the know. difference between Travis Kelsey and Hayden Hurst might as well be not even trading for a tight end at all. <laughs> the difference <laughs> yeah. between Travis Kelsey is like 20 to six points. That's a 14 point gap. Whereas if you trade Travis Kelsey for Darren Waller, Darren Waller might score six less points a game than Travis Kelsey, but he's also scoring 12 more than probably like the seventh tight end after him. So Getting that positional advantage, although is crazy with Travis Kelsey, it's also going to be a pretty good positional advantage to be put in a spot with Darren Waller or Hawkinson and maybe Fant, who I'm a little bit lower on than you are. But still, if you are making that trade down, Travis Kelsey will give you a 100% chance, basically, of having a tight end advantage in your weekly matchup. But Darren Waller, the only weeks that you're going to be at a disadvantage of the tight end position are when you're playing Kelsey, maybe Kittle, and maybe Mark Andrews, if that team knows how to throw the ball again. And then if you know how, and then if you add a first round pick on top of that, as we said, we rattle off the names and guys we like, like a Jalen Waddle, a Rondell Moore, a Rashad Bateman, maybe even a quarterback if they fall. The fact that you can get a, a an elite tight end by trading down to Waller, Hawkins, and Fant, and then getting what could be the next Justin Jefferson, or just even like a wide receiver 20 to 24 type of valued guy, that type of return and getting younger and just adding depth on your team is something that you might regret because Travis Kelsey is crazy and crazily elite, if that makes sense. But in the in the long run, I think it's definitely going to help you getting younger, moving off a 32-year-old tight end for a 28-year-old tight end, and then also getting a 22-year-old receiver, uh, yeah. maybe a 24-year-old quarterback on top of that. So for me, if I'm making these trades with these elite players, it's either to build depth or just get younger. And I think any of these trades that we outlined help you do basically both of those things. Yeah. I mean, it literally aside from Jared Goff, like I think no one on those lists we're selling is, is are players that we think stink. Right. Like, is that, is that fair to say? Like we For think sure. these are all really good players and, and they will contribute to teams. But what we do think is like you can capitalize and get some more value and like really build up that value in a crew to build up a dynasty. And, you know, you, you don't want to be like, I try to be a team that like kind of extends and, and builds a dynasty over, over multiple years versus a team that like, that contends one year and then collapses the next year and then contends one year and then collapses the next year, right? That's not a sustainable strategy. And the way to do that is to sell players when they're at the top to get more shots at the rookie draft, to try and hit on the next Justin Jefferson's try and hit on the next city lamb. It's the only way to do it. And it seems risky for sure. I completely understand that. It seems so scary to sell out on a sure thing, like a Devonte Adams, like a Travis Kelsey who are absolutely league winners. Right. But, you know, dynasty winners are, are what we're looking for here. And dynasty winners are, are accumulated through the draft and through some of these young ascending assets. So that's, that's really the way to look at it. And these are, just don't take these as like sell, sell highs. 
they're, they're not really meant as that way. They're more just like, hey, like the, capitalize on value and try and accrue high upside uh, rising assets that we see down the line. And that, that's really what it comes down to. It's not about getting out on these assets desperately. It's more about getting in on potential value risers down the, down the line. Yeah. And if we were getting out on them desperately, what would be the chances of people wanting to buy them as well? So these yeah. guys definitely have a market other than maybe Jared Goff. We'll see what happens with his ADP with this trade that just went down. But like people are still buying Josh Jacobs, who I, I mm -hmm. definitely don't like. People are definitely buying DJ Chark and they're definitely buying all the guys that Mike named as well. They have markets. And I think if they do have markets and you also view them as being hyped up higher than what their, perce their perceived value in ADP is, that's the perfect time to go out and get them, especially before free agency, especially before the draft where teams could realistically add pieces like the Jaguars could add maybe a Kenny Galladay. They could maybe add a wide receiver in the draft and that'll just tank their value. So get out on them early, accrue rookie picks right now before they start to blow up and just capitalize on the value. Like Mike said. Yep. All right. That's all we got for you guys. Hope you enjoyed. If you did enjoy, hit that subscribe, hit that thumbs up. Let Noah know about his haircut. Let me know how bad my haircut looks. We know we know we know we're ugly, but you know what? Show us some love. You know, show us some love in the comments. Um, you know, if you guys enjoyed, you know, hit us on Twitter, right? Follow Noah at FB God. Follow me at Mike Me Up with two Ps. Uh, we are on Twitter all the time. Noah is basically just on there trying to make people big mad, and I I love it. Um, I'm on there trying to make people cry. You know, this is what we do. You know, we're out, we're on there, we're trolling, but we're also providing good content. We're providing some good info. If you guys stick around, if you guys pay attention, we are providing the good content, but we're also providing the memes because that's what the fucking brand is about. All right. We cannot forget about the memes. All right. So that's all we got for you guys. Oh, also, uh, mock week, right? Get in on the Discord. Uh, Noah, Nick, and I haven't gotten in there yet because I've been busy, but I'll get in there too. We're hosting mocks. Uh, you know, you know what I feel, how I feel about mocks, but at the end of the day, they're fun to do and there's nothing else to do. And we want to get to get you guys some data uh, to play around with. So that's what we're working on right now. So make sure you guys get in there. Just hop in the mocks channel. Um, you can also volunteer to be a commissioner. Um, how did they do that again, Noah? Uh, they just DM either myself, Nick, or Mike, and we'll set you up with all the information on how to do that. And next week's video will actually be a mock draft with Mike, myself, and maybe even the godfather, Nick. We're going to record it sometime this week. So this is coming out Wednesday. We'll probably record it sometime this weekend so our times match up. Uh, and then we'll get that out to you guys next week so you can see how the ADP is shaking up. Yep. Celebrity mock with the godfather himself. So make sure you guys stay tuned. Stay tuned to all the videos. Make sure you check out the NBA Top Shots video. We got a sick new intro, courtesy of my boy, Tony DeBiase. DeBiase. Tony DeBiase helped us with that one. Uh, I got his name. I actually talked to him on Twitter. I did get it right, especially with the fingers. He appreciated that. So uh, that's our boy over there. So make sure you guys check it out, man. Noah and I are loving that content. Even in the down market, we're going to be providing the content for you guys. So check those videos out as well. All right. That's what we got for you. Peace. Peace.